Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of the day it is for you tuning us in. Welcome to another installment of JC and Morgan, number 175. I don't know if we get a cake for that or something, cupcake, anything, but 175 is a nice round number. We've made it to 175. Uh, here for uh, uh, all but one of those, JC Sherbert, who was out last week. Everything is uh, better in the world uh, of the Sherb, so that's good. He's a happy man. We missed him last week. Glad to have him back. Uh, he's in Chicago. Michael Haney hasn't been around for all 175, but the ones he has been around for, I like to think it's podcast gold. Uh, he is in the Music City of Nashville. I am in a, uh, a Hilton hotel room in Huntington, West Virginia, getting ready to call Marshall, Louisiana tomorrow on ESPN2. Wednesday night football. The, the thing I love about Wednesday night football is we are truly the only game in town. No NFL no other college games. Like if you're jonesing for football, like most of us are seven days a week, we've got you covered. We've got you covered. The defending Sunbelt champs, uh, Marshall, who of course had the big upset win at Notre Dame earlier this year. Uh, Aaron Murray and I will have that one for you. Looking forward to uh, to that. By the way, I always I get a kick of how, um, and I can understand why this might be misconstrued. The big beef about Thursday night football, particularly in the NFL, is that it's it's a watered down product because these guys are playing on Sunday. Your bodies don't have enough time to recover for a Thursday game. Right. That's what we hear. It's still not going away. It's too much of a moneymaker. And again, people want to watch football as much as they can. The other thing is um, they, they they just I don't want to say they don't care, but they just believe that the body has enough time and that it's it might not be as clean, but it's still a game. Well, in this situation, what they do when you see a Wednesday night game uh, on any of the the networks or like Maction on a on a Tuesday, the teams don't play the Saturday before or the Saturday after, so they actually have just as much time off, if not more, than a regular season game. I think that's an important little uh, footnote that I was curious about, just as a fan who's watched some of these games over the year. Anyway. Um, Fellas, lots to get to uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, we will start with the Hot Haney Five uh, on a busy day of college football. We'll go under the radar. We'll go Don't Sleep on SEC Spotlight. We'll look at some of the key matchups coming up this coming weekend. And, uh, of course, it wouldn't be a week in college football without more major coaching news. No, not a college firing a coach but rather an nfl team firing a once prominent coach in the college ranks who will probably be back in the college ranks more on that in a moment but uh jc let me start with you in terms of uh anything that stood out to you this weekend what you had your your eyes on uh and and what stood out to you in a, in a busy saturday of college football uh, I'll go with uh, Tennessee and Mississippi State on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I realize Arkansas was missing K.J. Jefferson, and I, I think the Razorbacks would have probably been a little more successful on offense that day. But Zach Arnett, their defensive coordinator, Mike, uh, I think he's a superstar. And you give Mike Leach a good D.C. to work with, and he could be quite dangerous, I think. And then Tennessee uh, – I had a lot of questions about their defense going into the LSU game. Uh, I don't think LSU had the best day offensively against the Vols, but uh, give them credit. Uh, Tennessee attacked them. They stopped the run. Uh, Tennessee got some turnovers in that game. And then when LSU finally kind of mounted a challenge at the end of the first half, you know, Tennessee came out the second half and continued to play strong on both sides of the ball. So uh, kudos to those defensive units. I, I think um, – you know, there were some questions about uh, the Vols, especially, uh, not so much Mississippi State, but when you, when you think of a Mike Leach coach team or a Josh Heupel coach team, you think of 54 to 44 games, and uh, they're playing pretty good on defense, and, and the timing is great uh, for uh, Tennessee heading into the Alabama game this weekend. So that's a, a huge deal uh, in Knoxville. Uh, and they uh, you, you got to play at least some defense, even as good as they are offensively if you're going to win these type of games. And uh, I think that side of the ball there is, is peaking. So uh, good for Tennessee and Mississippi State stopping folks. 
Yeah, you, you stole a little bit of my uh, thunder because I've got Zach Arnett as part of the Under the Radar segment. I've I've praised him before on this podcast, uh, going back to a couple of years ago. We might have even done a deep dive on him. We're going to do it again because I think a lot of people need to uh, know that name. He probably will be rumored for some head coaching jobs before too long. And um, yeah, Michael, I don't remember what my picks were. They felt pretty good again this week, but I know that whether I got the pick right or not, I was wrong about uh, the LSU Tennessee game. I thought Tennessee would win. I did not think LSU would get manhandled, and that's what happened. And I did not think that Tennessee's defense would show me what they did. Um, they they got some street cred with that one. I'm not saying LSU is the most dynamic, explosive offense out there, but I am saying I gained a little bit of respect watching Tennessee defensively. Um that that to me stood out. If we're going to really put Tennessee in that conversation, and of course they've got the big one this week, and we'll talk more about that. But even if they lose that game, Tennessee still has a ton of things they can play for if their defense can just be decent, just mediocre, because the offense is scoring almost at will against everybody. And I'm not sure if that's changing anytime soon. That one obviously was a headliner. Uh, and And of course, you know, the Alabama, Texas A&M won. Uh, again, I was right about who would win. I didn't think the game would be that close. But it, it just goes to show you, there, there's been so much controversy at, at all levels of football right now about the, we're, we're coddling the quarterbacks. We're coddling the quarterbacks. We're, we're, we're calling too many hits uh, that, that uh, you know, what is this, powder puff football, blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is watching college football, uh, with backup quarterbacks is brutal. I mean, in the NFL, it's brutal. And those are guys that were all Americans in college and high draft picks. And many of them are former starters in the NFL in college. You're watching guys that their, their right leg is getting warm because there's a substance being emitted from their body on, on the third snap of the game. You understand? I mean, it's they're They're not ready for that type of responsibility. And so it's brutal. You saw that with Kentucky somewhat, I know Alabama's got a stud athlete in the making there, but he ain't Bryce Young. I mean, Alabama scores 40-something points easily in that game if they have Bryce Young. They didn't, and so that helped make that a game. I have no idea what that play call was on the final play. You're on the short side of the field, and you basically run like a quick out. They're playing man under. Alabama was almost that entire drive. They know where the ball's going. They're not going to let you have that. Um the throw wasn't good either, but uh, I mean, I'm sitting there. We we were just getting back to the TV in time to see that final drive. And now I'm thinking, OK, well, this should be exciting. And then I'm all amped. I'm like, I can't believe this is coming down to one play. I can't believe A&M might do this. I can't believe people are going to have to eat crow about trashing Jimbo Fisher for the last two months. And duds on the last play so anyway those two games for me uh, on the sec side of things stood out tcu stood out from the big 12 that continues to be a terrific story we did a deep dive on coach dykes last week uh big 10 you know the the, the stories are the same there they'll finally have some legitimate uh inner intra conference matchups with the michigan penn state and on the pac-12 i i continue to be not amazed pleasantly um, surprised with what Chip Kelly's doing with UCLA. Well, I will give a quick shout out, Mike. Uh, you, you did mention it is difficult to watch some of these backup quarterbacks, but you said the TCU Kansas game, you know, hat tip to Jason Bean coming in for Kansas. Yeah. Uh, Jalen Daniels is a guy that's been getting some Heisman love and it could have been very easy for, I think all of us would have thought, okay, well, Jalen Daniels is out. This is uh, everything's over for Kansas, but they stayed in the game for second half touchdowns and, and it was just a back and forth ball game. So tip of the cap to that young man for uh, keeping mm -hmm. in it. And, you know, they're still, they're a good team. I think they've shown now, even in a loss, they're still a pretty damn good team and can compete with just about anybody. You know what it says to see, I, I mean, I, I mentioned this last week, coach Leipold's going to get a lot of people fired the same way that coach Clawson at Wake Forest getting people fired because people look at that and they say, well, the, the, the common denominator is the players. It's not like Kansas had a, you know, in surge of um, 25 star recruits and they just raked 
in the transfer portal because everybody decided they wanted to be a part of the most woeful team in college football and power five the last decade. It's just the same guys, the same ham and eggers, but you change the coach and all of a sudden they're like a top 25 team. I think people look at that and they, that's why fans are so quick to want to fire coaches because they truly see stuff like that, which is really the aberration. It's the exception of the rule. They see that and they say, well, clearly the problem is the coach. And as soon as we change that out, then it's going to be solved. The flip side to that is Nebraska. The flip side is Miami. Yeah, you know, programs that keep doing that and nothing ever changes. So I, I the, the, but, but fans aren't going to remember those. They're going to see Kansas and Wake Forest all of a sudden winning with coaches that uh, clearly have changed a lot. It's hard to really put your finger on what exactly it is. It's so generic to say, well, he changed the culture. He changed the culture. Well, what the hell does that really mean? He changed the culture. You put, you put up a motivational sign in the locker room. You you, you gave out more demerits. Like what was it? You changed the team meal. What does change the culture really mean? But clearly it's a thing. And in some places it makes a, a, a radical impact. I think the culture thing, and, and you do hear that term a lot, and people overuse it, and it's hard to define it specifically. But I, I do think, you know, in college sports, you know, a lot of – in pro sports, you don't spend a lot of time motivating, right? They're playing for a paycheck. Uh, college sports, sometimes you got to motivate guys. And, and there's different – types of motivation and different ways you can get across your team and, and get them to believe a lot of times, uh, Mike, uh, with the way this sport goes, you know, the, the, the emblem on the helmet sometimes is worth a touchdown because your, your players, no, no matter how down a program is, uh, they believe they're going to win and the fans do. And, and there, there's, it, it's almost mystical, I guess, <laughs> when they talk about the, the culture change and stuff, when, uh, when it comes to some of these programs that, um, look that way. So I, I you know, I, I don't know, Georgia tech, I, I had questions as to whether or not they were going to win another game this year. They've won two in a row. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what was the, what was the big change there? You know, it's, uh, they, they moved their offensive line coach to head coach. So um, I don't know. It, it's hard to define, but uh, I do believe that it exists and, and, and there's different types of ways, uh, different coaches and different programs sort of arrive at that um, aha moment, which, uh, where the culture has sort of flipped. All right. Well, uh, gentlemen, you ready to get into the hot Haney five and and lead off with uh, the first topic that kind of takes us right into that, that very subject. Um, and number one on the list is I think a lot of folks said, Hey, you know what? This is the perfect fit. You've, you've kind of been left uh, with, with little choice, at least at the time when Lincoln Riley left Norman, Oklahoma to go out to go out West and, and coach USC uh, but Brent Venables, uh, you know, uh, the the son coming back home was supposed to be the perfect fit. But, gentlemen, um, just to use a, a phrase from Stuart Mandel, uh, his debut has devolved into a perfect storm of calamity uh, right now. 49 to nothing in the loss to Texas, the third in a row. Um, I just want to read you a few. There, there's so many historical numbers that it's hard to keep up with with what's going on with Brent Venables and his uh, his first six games with the Sooners. But this is one that I, I did find interesting, especially given that we do the pick five at the end of every episode here. Uh, this comes from Bill Connolly with ESPN. And um, you know, this is company that you don't want to be in if you're a first year head coach or any coach, period. Uh, but this is a, an interesting stat. Bill Connolly does a lot of the advanced analytics and advanced stats. But I I thought this was uh, this was one worth noting. Uh, the largest underachievement versus the spread in a three-game span for a once-ranked team, and this is over the last thirty years. Yes, yeah, a lot of words. It's a it's a, it's a word salad here. But the largest underachievement versus the spread in a three-game span for a once-ranked team over the last thirty years. Uh, Oklahoma comes in at number five on the list uh, at minus ninety-eight. Minus wow. 98. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just to think that that's number five, uh, we're, we're going, going there with 2005 Colorado at number four at minus 99 and a half. Again, this is uh this is all point spread stuff. 1999 UCLA at number three at 101 and a half points. Uh, and 2011 Texas tech number two with 107 and a half points. Uh, and then John Makovic's 1997 Texas Longhorns with 110 and a half points. 
points again against uh, the spread, the, the worst performances with that. Uh, also, the the coaches for a first year head coach is the same thing except first year head coach number one Turner Gill uh, minus one hundred nine. Brian Knorr of Ohio in 2001, minus 101 and a half. Vic Koning, 2000 Wyoming, negative 98 and a half. And then Brent Venables coming in at number four with Oklahoma at that minus 98 number. And Paul Wolf at 2008 Washington State, minus 98 and a half. Uh, gentlemen, uh, there's a lot of different things that can be said about this, but suffice to say, you don't want to be, uh, I think, on the list with Paul Wolf and Washington State or uh, Turner Gill's Kansas uh, tenures uh, if you're Brent Venables and you're just starting out your head coaching career at Oklahoma. Paul Wolf, huh? Mm -hmm. We got a Paul Wolf mention in the show. Not he was awful. By the, the Wolf of Pullman, not the Wolf on uh, Wall Street. Um, this is weird for me because I was in Norman week two and I watched Oklahoma. They weren't overly impressive, but they were impressive enough. And there's there's clearly some weapons on offense defense did not look good then and has looked atrocious since Dillian Gabriel, our, our own, uh, you know, AAC correspondent UCF night 94 will tell you he wasn't a big fan of Dylan Gabriel when he was at UCF. I mean, he's a competent quarterback, but he's not a Heisman type talent of Caleb Williams, who of course Lincoln took with him. And that's not all Lincoln took with him. Um, so this is in the old days, if you lost a guy like, well, in the old days, you wouldn't leave Oklahoma for Southern Cal. Those kind of things just didn't happen in college football. But in the old days, if you did, you wouldn't be able to take uh, a number of your players and the rest of them wouldn't feel obligated to just jump ship because you can transfer right away. And, and so Oklahoma would still be intact. They are not intact. And that is being uh, completely exploited. Uh, take your shots while you can. Um, and a lot of people have been doing that. They want to uh, – their offensive coordinator is Jeff Lebby. He's the same guy that transformed Ole Miss's offense and made Matt Corral into a high draft pick in the NFL. Did, did he forget how to coach offense? I, to me, this is a more byproduct of two things. Number one, the talent is not what Oklahoma is used to having. It's just not, and it's going to have to be fixed in the offseason, and there's going to be a major change the culture uh, moment uh, in Norman, and I do think Coach Venables will be fine. The other thing is – Dare I say, Big 12 is really damn good. I mean, this is this is like a banner year for the Big 12. And we don't talk about it as much, and the national media doesn't talk about it as much because there's no team in the Big 12 that you truly think is going to win the national championship. But if you judge it on depth and go 1 through 10, that is a damn good league. I mean, if Kansas is good, and TCU is really good, and Oklahoma State is good, and Baylor is good, and and Texas has found their way. Like, that's a really, really good league. So you pick the wrong time to be down, uh, which Oklahoma clearly is. But, uh, again, beat them up while you can. I don't think this is going to last. Venables is going to be fine. I think this is more a byproduct uh, uh, Brent, of the, the transformation from last year. Yeah, they lost a lot of players last year. And, I, and I'll say this, uh, you know, with Dylan Gabriel going out against TCU, I, I just looked and I didn't realize da Davis Bevel, uh, it was the Oklahoma quarterback. And uh, uh, Davis Bevel played at Greenville High School in South Carolina. Uh, they play in a place called Serene Stadium. Uh, which was kind of in my backyard in my condo that I lived in in Greenville when I lived there till like 2019. I've seen this kid play uh, mobile. There's nothing mobile about him at all. He's a statue back there. Uh, I, I was shocked that he ended up making his way to Oklahoma. He originally signed with Pitt. Um, he's sort of a, a Pitt style guy, kind of like Max Brown that used to play there. Uh, but I was shocked he took the the keys of the Oklahoma offense this past weekend. Uh, and then uh, they didn't really trust him enough to throw it. I think it was 6 for 17 that they ran all kinds of wildcat, direct snap, uh, craziness. I mean, th they were down 28 nothing and a half guys and uh, were averaging 5.8 yards per carry, which is crazy. So uh, that was um, that was the deal there. And they also have the the, the third quarterback – Booty is it General Booty? It's one of the best names in, in like college that. football. General Booty. I, General I think that's Booty. that's my stage name. Yeah, 
general yeah, booty. <laughs> I, I have a, I, you know, it's the 25th anniversary of Boogie Nights. Somehow that that did not make the movie, but I think uh, Jack Horner would certainly find a role uh, for the general. Uh, he could work for the colonel, for that matter. Uh, anyway, I, I don't want to go too deep on Oklahoma, but yeah, it, it's there as big a disappointment as there is in college football. But I think it was a little bit of an oversight on a, a lot of our parts to to look at the roster and think, well, they won 11 games last year and it's Oklahoma. You, it's like clockwork. They're going to win 10, 11 games every year. I don't think that was the case because I don't think this was a typical lose your coach like if they lost Lincoln Riley to the NFL, which was rumored for years, and they just kept their roster, uh, that's a different that's a different deal. They had one of the most shocking departures in the history of college football for a guy to leave a, a prominent program, a blue blood, if you will, that he had great success with, to go to another program that has been struggling out west, and then to take the starting quarterback, who's one of the best quarterbacks in the country. That just that doesn't happen, but it does. Mm -hmm. It does in twenty twenty two, and it did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, last year was kind of a, it was a uh, you know in Augusta National they call it moving day. It was like moving day for a lot of these big time coaches. I mean, because you had uh, Lincoln Riley leaving uh, for Southern Cal, you had um, Brian Kelly left Notre Dame. Uh, so 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 the the sitting head coaches at Notre Dame and Oklahoma left for other jobs <laughs> and that just Incredible. doesn't happen no it just doesn't happen um you know and, and i think maybe it will happen more uh as we move forward because the money's so big and all that i mean or, or it may not i mean we may go back to like well this doesn't ever happen you know and, and so that's uh it was a very interesting off season to say the least and i'm i think a lot of people like you said mike with oklahoma did get did kind of forget about the fact, Hey, a lot of not only Lincoln Riley walks out the door, a lot of really doggone good players walked out the door too. So it, it may just take some time and and the strength of the big 12 uh, certainly doesn't uh, help things, especially uh, with the Kansas Jayhawks coming to town this weekend uh, to, play the, to play the Sooners in Norman. I mean, that, you know, you have to say Kansas would probably be the favorite right now. Um, and so we'll see uh, if they can get back up and, and get a win. I do want to have an addendum to this, and this is just because, you know, we can do this and we can speculate um, just because Oklahoma is just not a, a normal job. And that's why I asked this. I, I firmly agree with both of you. I, I think he's going to be fine in time and, he, and he's able to rebuild the roster. But let's just throw it out there for the sake of it, because, you know, if things stay a little bit sideways, who knows? Because, again, Oklahoma doesn't really deal with upheaval very well. I mean, they don't lose. Guys, they don't lose like this. This is this is all historic, uh, you know, losing for Oklahoma. But let's just throw it out there. Uh, is Brent Venables the head coach of Oklahoma when they join the SEC? That's a well, tough, tough call there. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question on two ends, one of which is do we know exactly what year they're, they're going to be in the SEC? I think it's going to be a year early. Uh, I think it's going to be in, in 2024. And, yes, yeah, I – Again, I stand by what I said. I, I think I think Brenda Venables is going to be fine. I think Oklahoma is going to be fine. But they are going to have to take their medicine this year because they, they, this is just – well, it's an interesting question might be on two fronts because, A, we're not exactly sure – we're not exactly sure when they're going to join the SEC. I think it will be a year early in 2024. And then, you know, Brent Venables is is to me is going to get the talent that Oklahoma always gets, and if that's the case, uh, they're they're going to get a blue chip quarterback. They're going to continue to get, you know, blue chip receivers, the CD Lambs of the world, and they've got some good ones now, but they don't have one quite that good. They don't have an Adrian Peterson in the backfield, and defensively over the years, uh, I mean, the names that that come to mind, Roy Williams is one of the first one. Uh, that's mm -hmm. kind of dating it a little bit, but they typically have like a first rounder on the defense, sometimes a couple of them. I don't know if I see that right now in Norman, but you mean to tell me Brent Venables could do a great job recruiting at Clemson when he, when he got the job there, but he's not going to be able to recruit Oklahoma. Um, he's, he's not going to be able to coach up good defense at Oklahoma. I, I just, I don't believe that. I, I think Brent will be fine. 
All right. Well, moving along to question number two, uh, we head to the SEC where Oklahoma will be joining uh, soon enough, like you said, um, by 2024. Hopefully, I think for uh, for all college football fans, we go ahead and get this realignment stuff out of the way and we get the college football playoff expansion. Uh, you know, everybody wants it sooner rather than later. And uh, and hopefully we can settle into that for a while. But um what hasn't taken a while is for Tennessee to be relevant again, uh, guys. The the Volunteers, uh, JC, as you said at the outset, uh, answered some questions defensively in a huge road test on the road at LSU. I don't care what time of day you're playing. Uh, in the original Death Valley, uh, it's going to be hard uh, to go there and, and win a football game. We've seen some bad LSU teams still be able to beat some very good teams uh, no matter when uh, the, the time of day is. So for Tennessee to go do what they did and, and command that game and, and really reverse some trends, uh, LSU has been able to come back uh, from double-digit deficits in three games, winning two of them, uh, the only one that that first loss uh, of the season to Florida State. And Tennessee has uh, been able to, to allow some teams to get back in, namely Florida a few weeks back, and, and obviously a, a huge road game there at Pitt that they went to overtime with. But um, massive, massive game this weekend for Tennessee. And, and as, I, I can't remember the last time there's been a game this big in Knoxville for the Volunteers. I mean, we're talking early – early 2000s maybe, uh, that, that since they've had something of this magnitude to look forward to. Uh, therefore, uh, the Vol Navy to, to get excited about. But Alabama surviving the scare. Gentlemen, just want to do a little bit of, of a deeper dive into this game. It is the game of the week. It is the game day pick of the week. Uh, in a week of of lots of, of really, really, really big matchups across college football. But Tennessee and Alabama, traditional rivalry game. Uh, Alabama's dominated this game since Nick Saban took over. Uh, but for the first time since then, the Volunteers feel like they got a shot to win. I'll I'll take that one, I guess. Um, I I I think that it wasn't that long ago. A lot of Tennessee fans, if they were being honest, and maybe they were actually being very vocal about it on, you know, local radio and message boards that I don't know about. If you're really being honest, they would they would vote to take Alabama down as a permanent opponent. Because what what were you really getting out of that matchup? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't wasn't really doing anything good for the program. It leave the fan base with a bitter taste at the in the in the mouth at the end of every Saturday uh, in October. And you know, bottom line is Alabama was doing that to everybody else, but not everybody else was having to play them every year from the Eastern Division. That just happened to be the case for Tennessee. Now all of a sudden, Tennessee wants a piece of Alabama. Like this, you haven't seen that in a long, long time. You haven't seen that uh, since the days of Fulmer, uh, you know, and, and since the days that, but before Alabama got it going under Nick Saban. So, they're you know, it, about it, buying cigars, Mike. They're already like, hey, we got the cigars ready. I yeah, like there's, yeah. There's a lot I mean, of balls that feel like they've practically already got this game won. I'd be careful with that. I'd be careful with that. Look, I hope it's a great game. I, 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 I want, I'd want to see if, if this game is going to maintain a, as a regular, and I don't know if it will when the new schedules come out, the new format. But I, I want to see this game be competitive again, be relevant again. Give me something to uh, sink my teeth into because it's been anything but for the most part. I think the last one that was – that comes to mind, Mount Cody. Remember that the the block kick. Um, who was was that? Was that Lane? Was that, that Kiffin? was Kiffin's only Tennessee team? Almost knocked them off, and That's Mount right. Cody That's blocked right. the field goal. Butch, champions of life, Jones also had them almost beat in 2015. Both those games were in Tuscaloosa, and uh, that was a pretty good Tennessee team. Butch had that year. Josh Dobbs was the quarterback. Oh yeah, and yeah. then. Um, very good college. That quarterback. was like the year before they they threw the hail mary at Georgia and should have won the East, but lost to South Carolina and Vanderbilt and did not. Uh, you know, and and so Butch Butch had them beat. Uh, gosh, and, and and I think Alabama went the length of the field. I think that was actually Lane Kiffin was the offensive coordinator for Alabama that day. Um, Pace in Tennessee, but those are the only two times it's been close, Mike, in Knoxville. It has not been closer than a two touchdown game since 06, which was the last time Tennessee won against Alabama. That 06 Alabama team got Mike Shula fired mm-hmm. and uh brought Nick Saban to Tuscaloosa. So yeah. uh, and that was Fulmer. That was the the year before or, or two years before Fulmer was uh shown the exit. So it's it has been a long time since this game was competitive. 
uh, in Knoxville and it's only been competitive twice, um, you know, since uh, uh, since this streak started for Bama since Saban got to Alabama. He's absolutely owned the Tennessee Volunteers. JC, you, you, you've used a term – uh, that I like caged animal syndrome when a, when a program is just so tired of losing that they're going to do everything they take to get this one coach. And sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't, you can have caged animal syndrome and get your guy and still you lose, or you can throw a bunch of money and somebody else throws more, whatever the case may be. Uh, Tennessee, I think their fan base has had some of that. Like they, th- they have been just dying to be, where they are now and this all follows i mean you never know the path to success right because when you think about how they landed on josh heupel uh first off you had one ad who was going to bring in shiano and then there's like a revolt and then they bring in the 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 prodigal son and phil fulmer and he knows football so he's going to get a football guy and he brings in jeremy pruitt and which will go down as one of the worst hires in modern day SEC football history. And not only that, he leaves an unbelievable load of trash at the doorstep of the people that had to follow with the NCAA, with a roster that is completely ravaged by uh, transfers. And so you're thinking Tennessee football is going to be a joke for the first couple of years of Josh Heupel. Even if Josh Heupel's the right guy, they can't withstand all this. And somehow they have. And, and somehow... Josh Heupel, who wasn't the most popular coach at UCF, he wasn't. And 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 the fact that the AD knew him there, and so it just looked like kind of a, well, I don't know, I couldn't get this guy, this guy, this guy. So here, I know, I know Josh Heupel. Let's bring him in. Like there, that was the most non-plus hire. No one that I know of in Vol Nation celebrated that hire. And now, and in fact, if you look at his contract. Holy smokes. I mean, he's about to get G'd up big time because he did not get a great type of SEC deal. Uh, but but give Josh Heupel all the credit in the world, whatever he is doing. By the way, they didn't do it with their best wide receiver. Uh, and they're, Maybe their only NFL wide receiver, Cedric Tillman, who I think is going to be back for this game, if I'm not mistaken. I think Bryce Young and Tillman will both be back as we record this on a Tuesday. That's both subject to change, but... Anyway, the point is, like, you never could have predicted this path to finally crack the code for Tennessee to be relevant again. And where I started with this is I'm going to finish. You use the the cage animal syndrome term. I've always used the term volcano programs, right? There are certain programs in, in that their DNA in college football is they'll they'll be down. Everybody's down for a while. Notre Dame has been down. Texas is down. Southern Cal has been down. The Florida teams have been down. Everybody's been down. But the volcano programs, what separates them from 90 percent of every every other FBS program is that eventually there's just too many things in their favor to go back up. And I still have maintained that Tennessee is a volcano program. I realize they have to recruit nationally because they don't have enough talent within the state, but they're a national brand and they've won doing that before. And they have tradition and they have history and they have facilities. So. I always thought this day would come. I just didn't think it would come in year two of Josh Heupel. I just I just didn't think we would see this in 2022. So hats off to Heupel, hats off to the balls. And even if you lose, as long as you don't spit the bit against Bama, it's still a terrific story at, in Knoxville moving forward. We could see uh, – here's a, here's a fun scenario. Um, Tennessee knocks off Alabama, right? And then they lose at Georgia – and then Georgia loses to Alabama in the championship game. Mm. Oh, <laughs> intriguing. <laughs> so in that, in that scenario, Bama's in. Yes. But then what do you do with Georgia and Tennessee is the question, right? Right. I think you probably – we'll see. Would Georgia have two – they would only have one loss. So – I think that it would have to go to Georgia because they they would have won the division by virtue of beating Tennessee. So, um, but that's interesting. I, I don't think it's going to come to that. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but, but uh, we, we I, always I, love I to have these uh, Armageddon scenarios here. Yeah, here. that's a fun yeah, little brain see, teaser. Yeah. I've, sat, I've sat here and, and doubted them. You know, like I'll say this: Hooker, their quarterback, 
if you're Virginia Tech as a program, oh. right, you have to be sitting there going, what you know, what were you thinking? What are you what's going on? Like Justin Fuente, that was probably his downfall because I look I, I, I who did he pick again, JC? Who did he wind up who beat him out? Uh, I was a is a transfer guy from California. I can't um, even remember his name. That's how, that's uh, how... He, <laughs> they beat North Carolina in the opener last year. He looked solid. Burmeister, Braxton Burmeister was his Ooh. name. And uh, and he looked solid, but like I, I used to turn on Virginia Tech games, and I was like, "Boy, Hooker's going to be really, really good for them." And I, I remember him coming out of high school in North Carolina, just a very smooth passer, exceptionally accurate, terrific touch, um, and 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 it really good. You know, not just a it wasn't it wasn't really a runner, uh, although he can get yards with his feet. Uh, they got two backs that fit that system. They got a guy in Jalen Hyatt. Uh, who uh, South, for also from South Carolina, uh, from Columbia, uh, that's a burner that runs about a 4-3. Uh, Brew McCoy, who I never thought would even amount to much, uh, has really come on and led him in receiving the last two weeks. Uh, he was a five-star recruit out of California and kind of went to Texas, left Texas, went to Southern Cal, they tried to go back to Texas, then finally just left when, when Lincoln Riley got there. And, you know, Tennessee took him. I was like, well, I don't know if that'll work, but it's worked out, you know, in that system. Uh, I think, too, uh, and, and look, I, I was with you, Mike. I had a lot of questions about it just because I was like, well, uh, here's a guy that kind of got run off from Missouri and, and Oklahoma's an OC and UCF. That's one thing. But, you know, UCF kind of got worse, you know, the, the years he was there. Here's the genius of the hire. And I'll admit I was wrong as of right now. You know, I was totally wrong. Join the club. You know, I mean, this guy, I mean, the genius of the hire by Danny White, Tennessee's athletic director, was, you know, because they needed to get a coach in place quick, right, and, and kind of settle the, the the masses. And Josh Heupel, you know, probably was not an inspiring hire. But dadgummit, the brand of football they play is exciting. And Jeremy Pruitt football was a rock-throwing contest. And Butch Jones was – an uneven mess and Derek Dooley was not fun. I mean, you had to probably go back to Lane Kiffin to see when Vol football was like this entertaining and fun to watch. And so I think sometimes, you know, with that hire, you're like, well, win or lose, you know, we're going to be really entertaining and score a bunch of points and that will buy him some time, you know, to get it mm -hmm. going. If, if we face it, so that was the genius of the hire, I think is just, sort of looking beyond the name and looking at the product on the field and 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 and, and kind of hedging your bets that way. Danny White, though, their AD is one of the best in the country, always has been. You look at the guys he hired at UCF, Buffalo, wherever he's been, uh, he's he's made these hires that uh, tend to work out. So hats off to the Vols, and certainly for all my friends out there that are Vols fans, Vol Nation, uh, I'm, I'm excited for those guys this weekend. Yeah, they certainly seem to have, have righted the ship from well over a decade of athletic department mismanagement. I mean, yeah. like this, uh, j just across all sports, I, I believe at one point uh, it was reported, I think back in 2016 um, or 2015, they had about a 30 plus million dollar rainy day fund that had been liquidated to pay off coaches. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And so when you have that kind of situation uh, and then you're, you know, you're giving, like, again, Phil Fulmer was given a five-year contract extension the year that he was fired. <laughs> he got right. eight or nine games in and was fired. And, you know, that was just one of many examples, you know, not to go too deep into the, into the well of what was going on uh, there on Rocky top, but you know, there's, there's been a reason and it just goes to show that not just, who you have as a football coach, but who you actually have being responsible for your money and making the decisions truly, truly matters uh, for your athletic department across the board in Tennessee was in the wilderness for a long time. And it looks like they have been able to find their way out. One final note on this, just Tennessee, Alabama. What is it about the Texas teams that have gotten to, to Alabama? You know, you've got the Longhorns and the Aggies, both uh, taking Bama to the wire this year. So uh, just an interesting little coincidental footnote uh, so far for the Crimson Tide and what they've got going on this year. Uh, so that moves us on to uh, our question number three, and we go all the way across the country. Uh, we did a, a segment on this uh, a few weeks back about uh, the relevance of the Pac-12 and and the strength top to bottom. Uh, but right now, the, the cream is starting to rise a little bit. And for the first time since 2005, Lincoln Riley uh, and Southern Cal are 6-0. and And so 
are Chip Kelly and UCLA. Chip Kelly's kind of been quietly going about his business uh, out there. And, and this year, uh, they are kind of uh, upstaging uh, Lincoln Riley in his first year. Dorian Thompson Robinson uh, is, is a quarterback there, maybe getting a little bit of Heisman love and, and Heisman favor right now halfway through the season. But, uh, gentlemen, um, uh, UCLA knocking off a Utah team that was in the top 10 to start the season before their loss to Florida and, and had an opportunity to – uh, to, to kind of get some respect back and, and really stake claim there in the Pac-12. But Chip Kelly and, and his charges had something to say about it. Uh, your thoughts right now on the, the California teams getting right just before they leave the conference for the Big Ten. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not much for me to add on Southern Cal other than they they got one of the preeminent coaches and they poached one of the preeminent quarterbacks and they already had some talent and then they just added more talent. Um, so that to me is not, a big surprise. UCLA is the story here. Uh, DTR was one of my under the radar a few weeks ago. He, he, I think he's, I think he's been there like six years. Uh, so he's one of those, we've got like quarterbacks now playing college football that are like 24, 25 years old. It's not even that unusual anymore. Uh, we got a couple in the SEC for that, for that matter with, with hooker and Stetson Bennett. Um, so the, but here's the thing, like the chip Kelly, uh, I always I thought he got a raw deal in the NFL. He had a he had a, a player by the name of LaShawn McCoy who clearly sold him out and and tried to make him look like a bad guy and and turn his uh, locker room against him. Uh, I thought that spoke more about LaShawn McCoy than it did Chip Kelly. Um, he was a brilliant coach in Oregon, put that program on the map in, in a lot of ways to, to the level that they got under him. Um, and. You know why it didn't work right away at UCLA? Hard to say, but it hasn't worked much for anybody at UCLA in a long, long time. I wonder deep down in the uh, the bowels of honesty if if Chip would say maybe he should have taken one of those other jobs because he pretty much had pick of the litter. Uh, but nevertheless, he's still a, a damn good football coach, and it's now finally starting to uh, to to translate. So I mean, kudos to him. I, I think. I think Chip Kelly is a, a good story. I think it's good. We've talked about this before on the show. It's good to have somebody out on the left coast with some relevancy. Well, now we got two. Uh, and yeah, it, is it heartbreaking for the Pac-10 right now to look at that? You bet. It's devastating mm. to see this happen and then to realize what are we going to rely on. But uh, no, I think that's I think that's one of the best stories this year in college football is Chip Kelly. Yeah, definitely. The undefeated. And, uh, you know, Utah was kind of the favorite. And then they knocked those guys off uh, last week. Now, they got an open date. And then they go up to the, what do they call it, the pond or the duck pond? No, they don't. But it's uh, Altson Stadium uh, in, in uh, Eugene, Oregon to play the Ducks. That's going to be a challenge for them. But, uh, you know, Mike, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Southern Cal and UCLA undefeated. Uh, and playing in that 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 uh, rivalry game the weekend. Oh, that's like Thanksgiving. Troy yeah. Aikman versus Rodney Peep Day. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, they don't they don't now they they, they UCLA would have another game at Cal uh, that Friday, and UCLA USC I think plays Notre Dame after that that uh, Thanksgiving weekend. But it's the weekend before Thanksgiving. It it, uh, it would be. Uh, uh, very good, I think, for for Los Angeles area football uh, because uh, honestly, that league has been dominated by the teams in the Northwest, Washington, Oregon. Uh, while you know UCLA and, and SC have gone through the wilderness. Chip Kelly, fourteen and four in his last two years, uh, started out not so well. <laughs> uh, I think he, he was ten and twenty one his first three years. Um, including an abbreviated seven game schedule in 2020, but 14 and four uh, since that point. And, you know, I think, I think there were some doubters. Uh, I, I, we've talked no about question. It. We've there talked were, about how it wasn't yeah. working, you know, and, and how we were shocked that, you know, Scott Frost and, and Chip Kelly, the, the, the two guys that uh, I, I think we had the conversation, Mike, where, where the two guys that did not get the Florida job were struggling while Dan Mullen uh, was winning, mm -hmm. and then lo and behold, Dan Mullen got fired before both of them. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how that works. Isn't well, it? Uh, yeah, Florida better be careful of that. They're going to become the next Tennessee if they keep 
you know, shuffling through coaches yeah, like that. But, yeah, they they barely you know. escaped Missouri. We'll talk. But by the way, it was it's the zoo that you were trying to think of for the zoo, the Altson Zoo. Zoo. That's it. Altson the pond. Zoo. The pond. What the heck, man? Uh, the, the pond has a nice ring to it. I like it. I like you it. know, the pond. Let's go to the pond. And feed the ducks. Oh, little, that's good. You know, a little. That, that is intimidating. So Oregon State called. There's the dam. That would be good, but I, I've never heard that. Me neither. Oh, well. All right. Damn, damn. All right. Well, that uh, uh, th- these two teams, by the way, um, uh, Southern Cal plays Utah this week, uh, which is now a disappointing four and two and potentially staring down a four and three start to their season after a, uh, a, a top 10 opening to the season for them. And uh, the Bruins off this week, they get uh, number 12, Oregon, who. Uh, in spite of getting smashed by Georgia to begin the season, is now averaging nearly 50 points per game, gentlemen. So uh, Chip Kelly and the Bruins and uh, and Oregon here in a couple of weekends are going to be one of the top games to watch out for there. But with that in mind, Chip Kelly going to the pros, coming back to college, eventually getting things right leads us into question number four. Uh, Mike, you alluded to it in the intro, but Matt Rules, uh, the experience uh, in Carolina is uh, – is over. Um, I think much to the delight of many Carolina Panthers fans. Um, but uh, Matt Rule, uh, the so so which school for Rule now, or, or Rule for your school? However, however you want to say it now. Clearly, he's going to be uh, a name atop the list of so many uh, of these uh, head coach openings uh, for Matt Rule right now. So uh, the, the question that I have for you here is: Will uh, will a uh, it's multiple choice. A, will Matt Rule coach one of the current openings right now, that being Nebraska, Georgia Tech, uh, Wisconsin, Arizona State, or Colorado? Uh, B, uh, he will coach another college job. Or C, he's just going to sit on that fat stack Scrooge McDuck money uh, and uh, sit out a year and, and wait and see if something else pops up. Guys, uh, your thoughts. JC, we'll start with you on the uh, the future of Matt Rule in college football. I think he's a heck of a college coach. I mean, look, man, you can't. Uh, you know, in, in dealing with the South Carolina market like I do, there's a lot of Panthers fans that, that are mixed in there. I, I'm not a Panthers fan because uh, when I grew up, the Falcons were the close team, and I they, they stuck the pan they, they they shoved the Panthers on me in '95, and I'm just you know unless they go to the Super Bowl. I mean, but yeah, there's a lot. My point was a lot of the college fans around uh, that are Panthers fans they don't think he's a good coach, and I'm like, oh, 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 oh wait, oh. oh, oh. Uh, I think he is. I, I think there is a long list of guys that are college football Hall of Fame level coaches that go to the NFL and get their head handed to them, right? Um, so I'm, I, I, I think he's going to be very attractive. He's got a proven record. He stepped into a mess at Baylor, uh, turned that around pretty quick, turned Temple into uh, what was for a time a launching point for jobs. Um yeah, you know, Jeff Collins should probably write him a thank you note because that's uh rule left and uh Collins, you know, and they all got jobs. Uh as far as the fit goes, I could I could really see him fit at Nebraska. Uh if Georgia Tech can hire him, uh, then they need to do it, but I doubt they can. I doubt they will. There's a lot of talk about Auburn with him uh out there. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I would lean more toward, uh, he will probably get a job that is not yet open. Uh, because I, I just don't, you know, is Matt rule really going to go take Nebraska? Uh, he's taken worse jobs before, but you know, he, now he's more in demand, you know, uh, will he take Georgia tech? I doubt it. You know, I, I think, I think Georgia tech is going to take a lot of TLC. Right. Um, you know, uh, and so the uh, Wisconsin, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jim Leonard or Lance Leopold will get that job. They'll either promote the guy from within, or go bring home the uh, state of Wisconsin legend Lance Leopold uh, to, to do like like the Bo Ryan situation in basketball, right? Um, so I, I don't really see him fitting uh, at most of the open jobs. I, I think it'll be something that does come open. Uh, Maybe before the season's over, maybe not. So uh, th- that would be my guess on him. And by the way, I-, I wanted to add this real quick before I throw it to Mike or, or Michael on-, on the Pac-12. I didn't. I-, I guess this got lost on me. The Pac-12 abolished divisions right. this year. 
So, okay, we could have USC, UCLA meet undefeated the weekend before Thanksgiving and then come back two weeks later and meet in the championship. That's game. right. That'd be pretty right. cool. All right. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah, Matt yeah. Rule. Um, you're not the only one that didn't notice that because it happened in the Pac 12. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, for the Pac 12. When a tree falls in the woods. When a tree falls in those woods. Um, hey, don't talk about Stanford that way. Hey, hey. hey. hey how's, uh, how's Coach Shaw doing? Did he, did he oh. lose another game? Yes, he did. Nine Harvard. nine million Lost nine million be- plus the beavers it, the beavers cut him yeah it was a close game it was a close I, game I, I watched some of it boy you want to talk about the ultimate I was wrong but I was when I was high on them they had Andrew Luck they had Christian McCaffrey they were winning a lot of games uh, Andrew Luck hasn't walked through that door and neither is McCaffrey and I I don't do they even care over there like it's just like meh yeah we're just gonna keep losing um. We're going to keep paying him $9 million, uh, but we're completely in the abyss. Anyway, um, you, you hit on a key point, JC, and that is this is yet another example of a really good college coach. Doesn't work in the NFL, and I'm telling you right now, wherever he goes in, in college again, they're going to win, and, and ADs know that. So fans might be like, is the guy that just got fired by the Panthers? I heard he was an idiot. No, no. If you look at what he did, that the job he did at Baylor, he's a Northeastern guy. And the job he really would crawl on his hands and knees for, not that guys with $40 million in the bank have to crawl anywhere, uh, is Penn State. And that was for a while the big rumor. Like, after James Franklin gets fired, here comes Matt Rule. Well, Franklin's done enough to keep the job. And you know, we'll see how he does against Michigan, but you can't fire James Franklin right now. And and so that would that would be, I think, his number one. Um, I don't see him interested in Arizona State. I sure as heck don't see him going to Georgia Tech. And Nebraska, Wisconsin, Auburn. I mean, it's just like, I don't know if any of those are the kind of fit that he's looking for. So then it comes down to how badly does he want to do it in 2023? And only he knows the answer to that. Only he knows, but I'm with you. I I don't think those three jobs, as great as they are, are the ones he's waiting on. Now, he's going to be offered. I mean, this is going to be the Matt Rule sweepstakes in a lot of ways Um, because he has none of the baggage that like an Urban Meyer does, but his reputation is pretty damn good as a coach. So I think think it'll be interesting, but if you you made me pick, I, I might also go with a punts on 2023 maybe goes in a tv booth does a little bit of that he's not camera shy and then um waits for his choice in 2024 or just waits for which you know which job comes open next uh you know everybody believes auburn will be that but maybe there's another one we're not thinking about yeah i I don't know that um you know again we could all we all have our choice and and he just doesn't feel like the guy that would that would be able to handle the circus that is Auburn. Who is? <laughs> I, I know, but he just who he is? Does not, he does not feel like the guy. Of course, he could he could you know go there and win and have a system and, and do do all the things that we think that he's capable of doing when he gets back in. But there's just something that doesn't quite click for me with with. Well, that. he's not going to be a puppet. There's no doubt about that. He's not going to be. You know, if the guy on Yellowwood calls his cell phone, he's going to hit do not disturb. He's not going to feel like he's not going to he doesn't need to play that game. Brian Harson needs to play that game. Uh, Matt, Matt Rule does not. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's that's the, that is the ultimate dichotomy. That is the Auburn job, because there's a lot going for that program. And we've seen it now, whether it's Gene Chizik winning a national title, whether it's Gus Malzahn getting to a national title and winning uh, beating Alabama three times with Nick Saban, by the way, I, you know, uh, you can win at Auburn. There's no doubt about it. But what is your tolerance? What is your tolerance level? I'm afraid, you know, as I, as I sat and I listened to all these people talk about Jimbo Fisher being on, on a hot seat that he's not actually on. I'm afraid we're we're getting closer and closer to where Auburn is more of the norm than the exception. You know, that all that people just associate Auburn as this completely out of control soap opera. Well, what are these, which of these major programs doesn't have some of that, right? Like it's, it seems like it's, it's out there more than ever. Just saying. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm with you there. It, 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 it's uh, it's nutty. Uh, Odd Shark said Matt Rule's next head coaching job: Nebraska, Auburn, Wisconsin, Arizona State, Colorado. There's no uh, way to Colorado. <laughs> Stan- <laughs> look at check this out: Stanford's plus one thousand. Uh, Oklahoma's plus twelve hundred. Texas A and M is on the board plus sixteen hundred. Uh, would the Aggies do that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we already talked about Oklahoma's not firing uh, Coach V after one year. Yeah, um, I, I, and you know, I just read too, uh, Mike. If his forty million he gets from the Panthers is offset by any college job he takes, so it may be that he just chills. Maybe does a little TV, no? you know. Uh, studio work and uh, gets back out there when there's, uh, you know, a better job. But we don't know. I mean, look, there could be a lot of surprising job openings this year. If, the, if, if you know, I don't think it'll be as crazy as last year, but kind of just depending on how, on how things go. I I've, mean, nothing would surprise me. I've crossed paths uh, directly and indirectly with Dan Mullen twice since he got fired from the Florida job. Once was at the ESPN seminar in Charlotte uh, in August. Couldn't have, couldn't have looked happier. Heard yeah. him to heard him today this morning on an interview. Our our, uh, our boys over there at Full Ride uh, Childers and New Heisel they had him on, and he was a little distracted on the interview. You want to know why he was distracted on the interview? He wasn't worried about the upcoming game or people questioning his play calling or his recruiting prowess. He was distracted because he, he he's got, as a guy's like I got to get on the tee box. He was on a golf course in the Bahamas, so. Uh. Life is not bad when you're a coach that just got canned with a major buyout and you can just sit out a year and weigh your options. Not at all. It's the best job in America. Yep. Best job in America. Be a failed football coach and, and you know, the, your, your ego can be solved plenty uh, with that uh, bank account. There's no question about mm-hmm. that. I've been saying that for years, especially, uh, I think, was it was it Charlie Weiss that got, he was the one that got that first big, 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 like, 10 year contract from Notre Dame. I think he was one of the first to do that. Nick Saban reset the pay, but Charlie Weiss was one of the first ones that I can recall getting the long term deal from Notre mm-hmm. Dame. And obviously that didn't work out. So um yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can make a you can make a killing being a fired football coach uh, in in the good old USA. I'm not mad about it. Uh, but you know, the fans of the teams can be mad about it for sure. <laughs> Go ahead and move on figure it out um the guys i want to wrap up with uh, a question i'm, I'm going to switch things up I, I know we had talked just a little bit before but i i, I got to go into into one because this is just so weird and um and it's just odd you know, to to see something like like this for a power five team uh in a in a conference where they seemingly have all of the resources and have things to be a, a competitive team in their conference, but the stubbornness of their longtime coach is really not going to allow them uh, to do it. But but Iowa's offense is just god awful. Uh, they're they're averaging just over 200 yards per game. That's 50 yards a quarter. They lost nine to six to Illinois. Their defense and special teams pretty damn good. If they just had a decent offense, even a mediocre offense, they could be competing uh, for the, the division and could be competing. Uh, in the Big Ten, um, but Kirk Ferentz has his son as offensive coordinator um, to get around the nepotism laws in the state. Uh, Brian Ferentz reports directly to the athletic director um, so that he can hold that position. This is just a, a it's the weird use of the structure uh, and putting your son in a position that, that clearly isn't, isn't working. Just very, very odd for me. I just want to get your thoughts on uh on the Iowa Hawkeyes and, and what they've got going on. They got a bye week coming up this week. Ference was uh, was feisty when asked if there might be some change to the structure uh, to try and shake things up a little bit. And he just flat out said, quote, I'm not sure if you're aware we won 10 games last year. Hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, anyway, guys, just um, I, I know we talked about it in, in an earlier episode about uh, the the uncomfortable uh, father-son coaching scenarios that, that we had seen throughout our, our time covering college football, but this mm. right now is definitely starting to hit that point where you're like, all right, man, <laughs> like your, your, your team and your program have way too many uh, resources for you to allow something like this to continue to fester. Well, I'll, I'll give the shortest answer of any of your questions today. It's, it's, it's untenable. Like it, 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 it's not going to be able to work. There's going to have to be a change made there. I'm pretty sure Kirk knows that. Um, Look, Kirk, Kirk Ferentz is a is a Hall of Fame coach. He's done a remarkable job with that program. 
I don't think Vi- Iowa is a volcano program. I don't think they're guaranteed to be uh, a successful program, no matter who the coach is. Again, he deserves a lot of credit, but they've had some issues there uh, off the field. Let's just say they've had some issues there over the last few years. And this is a move that in today's climate in college football, if something's not working and it, it reeks of nepotism. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. just, it, it's not going to, it can't succeed. Uh, so uh, I think you'll see a change there, and then somehow they got to figure out how to get an offense next year. I don't know how they get one this year. I think at this, you're too, you're too far in. You're halfway through the season. Like, what are you going to find some secret? Uh, you're going to oh, let's bring out the hook and ladder. That'll do it. Uh, you know, I think it, I think you kind of are what you are at this point. But moving forward for 2023 and beyond, something's got to change. I need. Mean, they need to. There's their quarterback Spencer Petras is terrible. I mean, I, I we I watched him. Uh, I've watched several Iowa games, Illinois. Um, I watched the South Dakota State game. This guy's arm is not good. He's not an accurate passer. He's not that athletic. Uh, he's kind of. Uh, I don't know what he brings to the table. Their backup, Alex Padilla, uh, is sort of a veteran. Um, you know, came in uh, from the state of Colorado as a recruit. Had 186 rushing yards, a quarterback against Nebraska in a start last year. Um, maybe it's time to to, 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 to kind of pull the, the old switcheroo and put the dual threat guy in there so you can get a little bit more uh, out of your offense. I mean, I, I've been surprised. You know, Iowa's whole thing is, you know, offensive line. They're always really good up front, and I don't think they're quite there this year. Uh, but you're right. I mean – you know, the stubbornness, the sticking with the quarterback, the not doing everything you can to get it going, and it's the coach's son. Uh, so you're under scrutiny as it is. Um, situation's not going to work. What I would do if I were uh, the athletic director at Iowa, uh, I would fire Brian Ferentz, <laughs> I guess, since he reports to you, and tell Kirk if he doesn't like it, fine, we'll go get Mark Stoops if we can. But doesn't it feel like Kirk Ferentz is, uh, has more power? Than the AD there. I, uh, well, I don't probably. know if he has. He might have more power than the AD, but ultimately the fans and the boosters are going to speak up, and he he doesn't have more power than that that conglomerate. Like th- this is this is not one of those where it's even that controversial a move. So, and plus, if if I'm if I'm Kirk and and, and or his son, like I don't feel good about this. It's not healthy. There's plenty of other jobs out there, so I I don't want to spend too much time on this. Yeah, but I, 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 I think I, just, I think I just find it fascinating. Like that's that's just one of those things. Just a, a team that clearly has some of the history that they have. You're right, Mike. They're not a volcano program, but you know Iowa's been pretty steady. I mean they've they've got a good history, and they're 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 too damn good of a program overall. Look, just, they're they're having a down year. I, I mean it, it 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 can happen to much better programs than Iowa. So. Uh, I don't think it's the end of the world. Like, I don't think the program is, is, is in an unrecoverable situation. JC mentioned quarterback issues, uh, play calling issues. Like they're just not that good. So it, it's a, it's a bad year. And when it's a bad year and your son is the coordinator on the worst offense of any power five school, then it's a bad look. And so, so I think a change will be made. All right. Well, that wraps it up for the Hot Haney Five this week, gentlemen. Again, touching on uh, Oklahoma, touching on uh, Tennessee and their rise, the Pac-12 relevance. Uh, Again, shout out to the interim coaches uh, there at Nebraska, Georgia Tech, Wisconsin, and Arizona State, all getting some wins there. But Matt Rule, uh, could he be in line for any of those jobs? Well, we touched on that a little bit. And then, of course, uh, the debacle that is Iowa offense. And I think it's time now that we – Take a little uh, light and shine it on the SEC, Mike. Uh, we'll start with Let's the do it. spotlight. Uh, well, again, we we mentioned the big games. Uh, let, let's talk about some of the other games uh, out there. Uh, Kentucky, South Carolina, certainly one of those games. Uh, JC, I know you had a close eye on on this one. Um, again, not to take away anything from the Gamecocks, I thought that was a huge win. Like that's a building block win for Shane Beamer. Uh, and, and, and I, I know Gamecock fans would never want to hear an analogy to the guy over there in the upstate, but what I see a little bit of Dabo, quite frankly, in Shane, uh, in Shane with the, with the swag, with the, you know, he, he, he's always on in a way 
but it's genuine. Uh, and when you're a program that's kind of been in the abyss, you, you need some of that. You need that boost of adrenaline. So did did he milk the comments from uh, Mark Stoops for all they're worth? He, he sure did. He, and he did it with a big smile. And uh, they're, they're trying to generate, you know, a new attitude around there. Um, and and I, I, I thought all along they three and two was exactly where they should have been. These are the kind of games that define your season and maybe define the direction of the program. So um, k- kudos to to Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks. If you're if you're Kentucky, you better get Will Levis back because you don't have a good offensive line. In fact, that's that's being kind. Uh, the defense has been nicked up, and you know you just can't win the games the way Kentucky's been used to winning games. So you got a first round quarterback, but when he's out, they don't have a backup that's that's anywhere near. And and that that's gonna that's gonna be an issue moving forward. And and they've got a very tough game against Mississippi State uh, coming up. Uh, Mississippi State was my pick to finish second in the West, and I continue to be amazed at 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 what they're doing. I know they had a terrible fourth quarter against LSU, but if there is a to me, it's Mississippi State and Tennessee are clearly in tier tier two, and then there's a drop off, and then there's tier three, like the, the both those teams. Uh, I'll I'll get to this and under the radar, but Mississippi State has things that you don't think a Mike Leach team normally does. They've got that this year in Starkville. Um, Ole Miss just you know takes care of business. I don't think Ole Miss is a great football team. Uh, I think they they very easily could have lost last week to Kentucky, but give them credit, they're still winning games and. Uh, They've got some very difficult ones coming up that's going to define their season. Arkansas, you know, you you need Jefferson back, and the the, the stock is the air out of the balloon has clearly come out in a big way. We, we all love Sam Pittman, but I just I don't think that's a great football team. I think people re- were a little too eager to jump on that bandwagon this year. Uh, and I think that's just about all. Oh, oh, Florida escapes Missouri. Anthony Richardson continues to be okay. Not great. Like you, you compare Anthony Richardson, for example, to Hendon Hooker. Mm-hmm. Now, Anthony Richardson is bigger, stronger, faster. He's got a YouTube video where he's dunking from the free throw line. Hendon Hooker can't do any of those things. You know what Hendon Hooker is? A much better quarterback because <laughs> he, he he's incredible throwing the football. He's incredibly accurate, incredible deep ball, maybe the best deep ball of anybody in the league. I mean, he, he is he's just smooth. And on top of that, his demeanor, you ever hear that kid get interviewed? Humble as apple pie, not, not worried about his brand. I mean, he's just son of a quarterback. Like, I, there's just a lot to like there. So, um, anyway, Florida wins the game, and, and kudos. They they eked it out against a Missouri team that just refuses to quit but keeps losing. Um, so, uh, you know, big games coming up for Florida as well. But those are some of the other things that stood out to me in the league. Yeah, I, I thought, uh, you know, Kentucky is a team that it's uh, even with Levis, they're kind of a spider web team. And uh, Josh Pate uh, kind of came up with that. So I can't take credit for it. But they, you know, like Ole Miss, got out to what a 14 6 lead. Uh, their stadium's rocking. Uh, and, and you're thinking, well, Ole Miss is running away with this thing. Or, or so you look up in the third quarter, it's 19 to 19, you know. <laughs> and and that, that's just kind of what Kentucky's been doing. Uh, I think their quarterback, their backup kid that played against South Carolina, he's going to be p- pretty good in a couple of years. He's he's got a good arm. He's an accurate passer, but man, it's just t- I don't care who you're playing against in this league, even even like Vanderbilt. You know, when when you're down, not only your starting quarterback, uh, but you're you're down. You know, your your number two running back, who's a veteran and smoke. You're starting right tackle. Jaquez Jones, their linebacker, was out. That's like five of your top 15. I don't care who you're playing in this league. It's tough to win, especially when you throw a kid out there uh, behind an offensive line uh, that's not the offensive line we're used to seeing from the Wildcats. So um, if Levis plays this weekend against Mississippi State, we'll see what happens. But uh, uh, I just think I think Mississippi State's on a roll, Mike, and uh, – you know, if you're looking for kind of a a, a storyline uh, that could happen, um, depending on what happens with Bryce Young, and I know you said he's going to play against Bama, but uh, 
what if we have a rematch in 1998 uh, in the SEC championship game, Mississippi State and Tennessee? Hey, I'm going to tell you what. I wouldn't mind seeing it, you know, no. to be honest. Uh, November the 12th or 13th, uh, I will be in Starkville calling Mississippi State, Georgia on national Ooh. radio. And when I when I got to sign that game, I was like, well, that'll be cool. You know, that's a that's a good matchup. Uh, the last few weeks, I am salivating over that game. Like that is going <laughs> to be unbelievable. That is going to be a really, really good game. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's a winnable game for Mississippi State. M- M- Mississippi State fears nobody right now. They fear no one. Now, the problem under Mike Leach, going back to his days at Texas Tech, is they would have that just kind of like uh, an inexcusable loss. Like, we just come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like you, you get all high on, on Texas Tech and their offense unstoppable, and then it was like, wait a minute, who they lose to? How had that happen? Uh, that, has been, that has been a thing. Um, but – I don't know. I, I mean, they are a complete team. I'll just I'll give you a sneak peek and a sneak peek into the under the radar. Zach Arnett and, and what he has been able to do, guy that they they got from Rocky Long, right? <laughs> the San Diego State San coaching Diego tree. San Diego State coaching tree. Uh, you know, a former baseball player and linebacker at New Mexico himself. I had them in the spring game a couple of years ago, and I came away with such a good impression of, of Zach Arnett. Uh, because you got to remember now, it's not easy to be a coordinator in that system because very often they score in like a minute and a half. So your defense is back on the field. Like even if you get a, a, a stop, you know, you're back on the field 72 seconds later. And so uh, you, you're out there uh, for a much more possessions than a typical mm-hmm. DC would, would have to worry about. That's why Mark Stoops, you know, you know DC's love – working with him at Kentucky because Kentucky plays the clock. Like they, they, they grind it and they make sure they limit your possessions and they try to win the time of possession. They're not interested in scoring in a hurry. It's mm-hmm. like the, the pitcher that would rather uh, get ground balls than than work for strikeouts. So I, I just, I, I think I look at, and Oh, by the way, under the radar, Dylan Johnson, hundred yards on the ground, two touchdowns. When's the last time you heard about a Mike Leach running back? Going for yeah. 100 yards and two scores, so crazy. Yeah, they look pretty damn complete. They do, and and, and they, they've got a uh, obviously the one in the Commonwealth this weekend, and then boy, Alabama. Gosh, they're, they're, when you looked at their schedule this year, I don't, I don't think you probably thought how well that's a ridiculously tough stre- stretch. But they, Alabama's got Mississippi State coming to Tuscaloosa. That the short drive. <laughs> From Starkville to Tuscaloosa, where you lose cell phone service miles. for 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you go through Gordo, Alabama to get there. Uh, they're coming to town after they play the Vols. So I, I, I think it's kind of interesting that, um, you know, that the that, that Bama's all of a sudden uh, got all these, uh, got, got some stiff challenges ahead of them. I find intriguing too. Uh, looking at this week, um, we've had all this conversation. It just shows the rise of these other teams. Hey, uh, LSU and Florida are playing this week. Remember when that was a big game? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That- I mean, look, it's still a big game. Right. It's one of those if Florida loses again. I mean, nobody's on the hot seat or anything crazy like that, but it's just like I think Florida's tolerance for losing to not so great LSU teams over the last few years, it's pretty much run out. They've pretty much run out of, of uh, uh, patience with that whole rivalry. And uh, Auburn at Ole Miss, the last time the Rebels beat the Tigers was 2015. Um, I guess this is the Brian Harson watch. I mean, guys, it, it, like, like we touched on last week, Mike, at, at any given point, it feels like the move will be made. He's not going to be the coach there next year. It's just a matter of when does it actually yeah. happen. Well, uh, if, if there's a big enough win for Ole Miss this weekend, they they pull away and blow them out. I mean, is this is this when it happens or – I don't know. Time. <laughs> when's the when's the bye week for Auburn? Oh, you know? let me look that up real quick. I mean, I, I've got the schedule here. So, I mean, is. I've heard different rationales on this. Like one of them is why not do it do it during the bye week, a little extra time for the transition, and then why not do it before you hire the new AD because you don't want the ads first order. Of, what's that? It's next. It's after this week. After this yeah, week. It's after Ole Miss. Yeah. So, so the school of thinking that I've heard. This is not uh, any scoop or anything. 
and, and, and maybe nothing to it. You, you would do it before the bye week and before you bring in the new AD as opposed to hire the AD and then say, yeah, hey, Jimmy, go go fire a coach here on the first week on the job. Like that doesn't seem like an attractive thing to do. So that's that's some of the thought process there. But well, only, I, only Auburn knows what Auburn's thinking. I, I'll say this, too. They, they say the interim coach, if he gets – because most of his – assistants are guys they're harson guys and then they said that some of them could just walk out the door too if, if they fire him and uh the interim allegedly is former um this is a rumor so this 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 is not scoop zach etheridge who played defensive back at auburn who's on staff there uh and it makes me feel old because i covered zach as a recruit and he could be the interim head coach at Auburn <laughs> here shortly. Yeah. Uh, so it makes me feel a little weird. But, uh, you know, it'll be interesting. If, if Ole Miss beats them, Ole Miss has – they have Auburn, they have LSU, they have Texas A&M, and they play Alabama November 12th. So, so man, we could, we could have a heck of an Egg Bowl this year, right? Incredible Egg Bowl. I mean, an incredible – the incredible edible Egg Bowl. Yeah. Um, and then – um you know, is so, miming peeing in the end zone, then it can't be – it can't be the best one ever. Yeah. And, and, and that caused, like, two different people to get fired. <laughs> that, was a, that was a big <laughs> pee right there. It brought Leach and Kiffin to the state of Mississippi. Yes, it did. So. Yes, it did. And I don't think Leach – Leach has not beaten – um hadn't won an Egg Bowl yet. Chris only had a couple of them, but uh, that'll be huge for – for many, many, many reasons. Is that all in the spotlight, Mr. Haney? All in the spotlight. You ready to go a little more under the radar? Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, – I already hit on Zach Arnett. And I mentioned Mike Leach uh, with with a, a running back. I mean, they're running the football now. There's a lot of people, and I'm not picking on them. Like, you know, I always talk about on this podcast, uh, we could all talk about all the things we were right about. That's not entertaining. I like to I like to talk about the things I was way off on. I didn't think Josh Heupel would be here in year two in Knoxville. I promise you that. Um, uh, so when I when I try to think of like uh, the things that were being said when Mike Leach got hired, well, his offense will never work in the SEC. He's too mm-hmm. stubborn. He refuses to run the football. Uh, his defenses don't work. He's only got five passing plays, so that will never work in the all these things that were said, and they were said by intelligent people. Some might have even been guests on our podcast. I'm not going to call them out because I like them, but it's all wrong. <laughs> Mike Leach is doing everything that you said he couldn't, and he's doing it uh, extremely well. Um, and my final under the radar. Oh, by the way, another another fine performance by Adrian Martinez. And uh, I continue to look up, check his records. Um, he actually signed his letter of intent with a a, a, a feather dipped it in ink. And signing, yeah, yeah, like, he's uh, been there for a while. Been there, been there a while. That was, uh, he had I think, it's sixteen oh two, right around the time of the steam engine. Uh, so we'll continue to find facts on uh, Methuselah Martinez, and um, and and don't sleep on. I'll go ahead and go right into don't sleep on James Madison football. Congratulations mm-hmm. to James Madison football, undefeated and nationally ranked did you guys know this did you know they're fbs did you yeah, know they're, they're, in they, fun belt, fun they're in the fun belt now i mean james madison's story. good man i mean they, they, they've been a uh a powerhouse for a while and it's a actually it's a it's a really fun school to go party at by the way uh, i don't know don't don't ask me how i know that but uh you, you've actually been on the campus yeah harrisonburg virginia it's oh, if, wow. you go, if you go from blacksburg towards dc um what road is that? Is that 77? No, nah, it's, it's uh, 81. If you go up 81, uh, kind of halfway, you, you'll pass. I think VMI is there and uh, James, but JMU is there. Well, it's a uh, solid deal. Yeah, I'm just going to combine my under the radar and don't sleep on. Uh, don't sleep on JMU because they're just continuing to, uh, to win games. Again, this is a, a program that has won one double A national championships. Uh, okay, I've got uh, a, a ten-dollar bill in my pocket. Anybody name me the head coach without googling it? Sig- Kurt Sig- is Kurt Signetti. Oh, good job! All right, JC. Uh, JC beat me to it. Uh, I know Kurt, I know Kurt a little bit. So he really? <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, I do. He's uh, uh, he was he used to be an assistant at Bama. He was an assistant. Um, 
you know, when I first got into the recruiting business, where was he? Pitt or somewhere like that? Well, he could, when you first like NC State, he was there for seven years. I think it was when he was at State. That's what yeah, I yeah. Years. So he, I had to look this up. I, I'll I'll tell you, um, Kurt Signetti uh, was he got the job. So he was an assistant at NC State in Alabama. He's at Alabama. His last year there was 2010. Okay. In 2011 through 2016, he's the head coach of IUP. IUP, ladies and gentlemen. Indiana Bill. University, Pennsylvania. That's right. Shout out and to then my he was John who went there. Oh, sorry, hey, John. <laughs> good, good to hang with you, man. Yeah. Uh, and then 2017, 2018, he was the head coach at Elon. And that's how he got the job at JMU. Like, I mean, he was a former off. quarterback at West Virginia back yeah. in the late 70s. Like, this. Oh, yeah. I don't know where this guy came from, but he's doing a hell of a job. So congratulations under the radar, Kurt Signetti. And uh, JMU also uh, in softball went to the College World Series a few years ago. So Charles Haley, a famous uh, JMU. JMU. They, they do well. They Henry recruit Clark. that talent in Virginia. I mean, South Carolina has a receiver named Juice Wells that had a big touchdown. The, the transfer, day. yeah. He came, he, yeah, he came in from JMU. You know, he called That's 80 right. passes there last year. So uh, good to see them rocking and rolling in the Sun Belt and uh, all that good stuff. I I thought they were a really good addition to that uh, to that league. Oh, and, and one other under the radar, um, if, going back to Matt Rule, you know, Baylor had six players drafted in 2022. And, you know, kudos to Dave Aranda's doing a great job. All of those kids that were drafted were drafted, uh, excuse me, were recruited by rule. I mean, him, him and his staff had a, they had a knack for finding under underrated prospects that turned out to be very good college football players. They weren't bringing in five stars when he was there. It was a, it was a disaster when he took over that job. Um, consecutive losses by power five teams. I think Vanderbilt's up to 26. Now want to guess who's second on that list? consecutive losses by a power five team or versus power five teams, I should say. So you can't, you Ooh. can't, you can't stop it's your streak. Not, by beating. Is it Virginia? Maybe no. Um, You're on the right track. It's not Virginia tech. Is it Stanford? Oh, Stanford. Oh, the fight, the fight in David this. Shaw's 11 wow. consecutive losses. Yeah. They may, they may. They Third may, on that list was maybe. tech and Nebraska before their interim coaches started winning games. Oh yeah, Georgia Tech has won two in a row. They beat the Duke Blue Devils the other day. Who knows? Maybe Coach Guy is the guy. Because I mean, I don't hey, think they're getting Deion Sanders, and I don't think you know Matt Rule and some of these. They're other halfway guys. to a bowl, and 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 they, you know, their interim coach went to school there. So he's an alum. He's yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's the right move. All right, Michael, is it pick time? It is pick time, gentlemen. Pick away. Let's go. What was I last week? Uh, you went uh, three, one, and one. You got the push with TCU in Kansas. That was a push? Yeah, seven-point spread there. All so. right. So for the last two weeks, seven, two, and one. Yep, you have uh, gotten on the right side of 500 now, 13, 11, and one on the year. JC, uh, sadly, you know, without uh, going last year, uh, you are a uh, five and 15. So, let's see if we can. Uh, hey, I would have picked South Carolina to beat Kentucky last week, though. Uh, well, I, I probably wouldn't that. have because I didn't know that Levis was going to be out when we recorded last week. So I can't even take uh, a shoulda, coulda, woulda there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you might have taken them to cover at least. Maybe, maybe. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, let's start things off with this, and I, I find this intriguing, and I, I want to just kind of bookend back around with our, our first topic of the Hot Haney Five and, and Oklahoma and, and Brent Venables. Uh, Kansas, uh, speaking of Kansas, uh, losing uh, or that game to TCU, 38-31. They go on the road now to Oklahoma. The Sooners, in spite of everything, gentlemen, are eight-point favorites at home. Eight-point favorites at home. I do not have at this time – an update on Jalen Daniels and his status for uh, the game right now. Um, but Kansas, uh, again, eight point dogs on the road at the Sooners who have been absolutely embarrassed. So you're making us pick a game where we don't even know if the starting quarterback is going to play. Well, the back did a great job. He did a great job. Have you seen Oklahoma's defense the last three? I, I know, but I've seen Jalen Daniels and that's a difference maker. So my pick would be different if he's in versus not in. 
would be my my point on that. You're well, my, gonna... point, my point being is that uh, the backup quarterback for Kansas still threw. All right, passes All right. against UCU. JC, so. you you start off with the pick on that one. I'm I'm taking the Jayhawks to cover plus eight, with or without Daniels. Because I I I, I I I think Oklahoma will win the game. I know that didn't count, but uh, I think uh, it'll be one of those down to the wire. 30, you know, 38, 37 type deals there, but I'm, I'm picking Kansas. Plus this eight. is the old for the gamblers know this. This is the ultimate track ga- trap game because everybody and their grandmother is saying, I wouldn't pick Oklahoma to cover rig eight against anybody. They were terrible. Mm-hmm. And Kansas is a great story. And, and but th- they always know something, right? Um, give me, give me Oklahoma. All right. See, the last time you talked yourself around in this, it was the Georgia Tech at Pitt, where Pitt was a 23-and-a-half point favorite on the road after firing Jeff Collins, Mike. So, and I started singing Ramblin' Wreck of Georgia yeah, Tech yeah. and Hell of an Engineer. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, again, you might might be able to pull this one off in spite of uh, yeah, not, not knowing Jalen Daniels' status in this particular game. All right, uh, a game we mentioned uh, earlier in the Pac-12, USC heads to Utah, the Utes. In spite of uh, getting uh, the doors blown off there in the second half against UCLA, three and a half point home favorites, home favorites against the Trojans. You guys, what do you got there? Wow. Another brutally tough game that I would completely stay away from, (laughs) but we're obligated, contractually obligated, thanks to Michael Haney. Uh, Utah. Wow. I'm going the Trojans. I know you just don't waltz into Rice Eccles Stadium and expect to win, but uh, I, I I just think there's too much. Uh, I don't blame you. I think they're the better offense, team. Too yeah. much offense. And they've got uh, the best quarterback. So, no, no doubt. Uh, between he and Rising. So, yeah. And, and they, you know, it will be interesting to see uh, – if they because they're that they struggle with Oregon State quite a bit, it'll be interesting to see what happens if they get in a low scoring game like like they did in, in Corvallis. But I, I kind of think they'll go in there and light them up, to be honest. All right, moving along, we go to the uh, ACC. Now, the ACC does have a another top 20 matchup with NC State and Syracuse, uh, the Wolfpack at the Orange, but uh, we're gonna stick with uh, with one. Uh, with Clemson at Florida State, Mike Norvell uh, in the upstart Seminoles. They've uh, they've lost a couple of heartbreakers, but four and two on the year. Uh, the Tigers go in to Tallahassee as three and a half point favorites. There's that number again. The Tigers, they've taken every punch from everyone so far this year and survived uh, three and a half point road favorites. Clemson. I think Clemson's finding their way. I think Florida State is finding ways to lose. They lost to a backup quarterback who barely even threw the ball uh, in that game against NC State. I'll take Clemson. Yeah, I, 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 if it were – the spread was a little bigger, maybe I'd, I'd think about going with the Knowles, but I, I pretty much think – and that's a, it's kind of a weird line, to be honest, uh, three and a half. But um, I, I, I just have not liked what I've seen out of Florida State the last two weeks. And then – uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they were not looking ahead to this one a little bit and, and didn't really uh, give Wake and NC State the the um, the respect they deserve. And when that happens, uh, and you play Wake or State these days, that you're going to get cut. I can't believe Syracuse is in the top uh, twenty. Uh, they're five and zero. Oh, I know. Undefeated. Man, uh, shoot, just kind of quietly going about their business. Dino Babers, baby. Uh, Dino. Moving along here. Uh, all right. The last two, uh, I think you guys should be able to guess here, but we're going to go with the marquee matchups of the year. We'll start in the Big Ten. The Nittany Lions going to the big house against the Wolverines. Uh, Michigan, seven-point home favorites. Seven-point home favorites in the Big Ten battle. I think that line is right where it needs to be, honestly. I think Michigan at home should win the game by about a touchdown. Uh but I don't know if I completely trust Michigan yet. They, they've had an embarrassingly weak schedule up to this point. 
Um, remember, remember that time that Jim Harbaugh was flirting with the Vikings and mm -hmm. ready to leave, and the fans were completely disgusted by that, and they didn't get the Vikings job. And it was like, hey, what's what's going on, guys? Hey, how are we, fellas? Go go Wolverines. Uh, you forget about all that stuff when you're winning, mm -hmm. you know, and you're nationally ranked and got a chance to go to back to back playoffs. I'll take Penn State to cover. I'll take Penn State in a close game, field goal game. Going with uh, the Nittany Lions as well, I, it, it just because they're a little bit. I mean, they're they're battle tested, having gone into Auburn and won like they did, and you know, so they've been in big environments before. Uh, they pulled it out against Purdue in the opener. Uh, I think I just think they're a little bit. You know, they're tough and they can handle that environment. And uh, to me, Michigan's schedule has been a concern. So I'm taking uh, Penn State. All right. And final game of the pick five should be no surprise for you. Bama at Tennessee, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think uh, at least 75% of the Vol fan base has already got their cigars cut. They're just ready to, to light them up uh, when the volunteers knock off the old nemesis Alabama for the first time in years. But Bama is Bama on the road. Uh, in spite of the questions around Bryce Young, seven and a half point road favorites going into Nayland Stadium. Oh, you've got seven and a half now. I've got I, seven and a half. I saw seven. So, so the the money is clearly going on Bama. Um, again, I would only pick that cover, uh, confident that there's going to be Bryce Young out there, a healthy Bryce Young. Um. Boy, seven and a half, killing me, killing me. That extra half a point, I don't like it. Just not a big fan of that point five. I don't like what you did there. It's, don't don't blame me. I'm not making the odds here. I think you secretly called your bookies and had them uh, tilt the scales of justice on that point spread. Mm -hmm. Tilt the scales of justice. The justice. Buford T. I mean, justice. I mean, Mike, let's be honest. You've uh, you've had uh, two good weeks in a row. I got to yeah. turn back to earth. I know. You're clearly trying to do that, and I appreciate the uh, the, the humble pie here. Um, look, I, I think what this comes down to right off the bat that stands out is Tennessee's defense ready to show up against a really good not, – not really good – Maybe the best offense they've seen all year. I'm not going to say Alabama's offense this year is really good, although I love me some Jameer Gibbs, a.k.a. Alvin Kamara 2.0. Um, and then the other thing is it just simply put is Tennessee ready for the big time, right? I mean, they've been they've been showing everybody who they are and, and offensively, and it's causing everybody – Alabama. I almost talked myself out of it, but I'm, I'm going Alabama. Sorry, Vols fans. It's still a great year. I just i i don't I don't know if you're ready for this one just yet. Alabama, without no further comment, no hesitation. No. <laughs> hey, look, uh, no, no, I, hey, Tennessee surprises me this weekend. I'll jump on the bandwagon, right? Yeah. I, I just uh, I've doubted them before. So, ball fans out there, if if you're listening, it's probably good that I'm doubting you again. Yeah, exactly. You, uh, Mike, you touched on it, though. This does have all the makings of one of those situations where Tennessee's clearly a really good football team. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they may be working themselves and the entire environment around this game into such a froth that they they forget what they need to do to go win a football game. Oh, I like that. What it feels like. The froth factor. I like that. Uh, yeah, look, I, I mean, the <laughs> hashtag froth factor. Look, the, the, these guys have not been in a game like this where they're expected by their fan base. Forget about Vegas. Those fans aren't there for this to be a competitive game. They're, they're there to finally see a win. And I can't even imagine what these tickets are going for on the, on the secondary market. So uh, it, it's going to be and, – and I've already praised Hendon Hooker. I think he's pretty unflappable. So I'm not nervous about him. But I am worried about some other things there. I, I am worried about the defense – I think they'll be they'll be tested. Uh, the fact that Alabama gave something for Nick Saban to be mad about and and you know kind of dress his team down for having that A and M game so close, I think that actually works in Alabama's favor. So I'll take Bama, but I hope it's a good game. 
All right. Well, that wraps it up for the pick five, gentlemen. Best of luck to you. And uh, Mike, we'll see if you can stay on the right side of 500, JC. Yeah. We'll see if you can, uh, you can get closer. We're going to have to hit that mute button before he gets closer. All right. I, I just Nose, take back, uh, no, take nosebleeds. <laughs> uh, Nosebleed tickets for that game at Nayland are a 360 each. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's going to be packed, man. It's going to be packed. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be incredible. Hey, this has been incredible for us. Really appreciate uh, JC. Great to have you back. Michael, good job as always. And I always want to thank our uh, fine sponsor, Blue Delta Jeans, bluedeltajeans.com, for the very best in jeans and pants, uh, among other accessories now. They just continue to expand their uh, catalog there. You can get custom fit online. You don't even have to go to the store to do it. And the feel, the look, it is truly second to none. If you're only going to have one pair of just, I got to have these pants for the big day, the big date, the big whatever, that's your pair. It's Blue Delta, BlueDeltaJeans.com. Check them out. Tell them that JC and Morgan sent you. All right, fellas, we will uh, be back next week. So for JC, for Michael, this is Mike saying so long. See you next time on JC and Morgan.